Scout of the Endless Frontier, The Weight of Worlds, Part 1 of 2, written and read by Elton Gar. Elias checked the last living organism from Cathira 6. The plant was showing some signs of growth as leaves stretched towards the light, though the leaves' edges were still brown, and it looked barely alive. But it was a survivor. It had kept going after the environmental collapse of Cathira 6 had killed everything else, and Elias planned to keep it alive no matter what it took. He dripped a few drops of water under the soil. His survey had suggested that Kilthira had been dying for centuries, and, having adapted to a harsh environment, Elias wanted to avoid the irony of it being killed by the abundance of the ghost weight. With that task done, he slid the glass door of the terrarium shut to allow the environment inside the glass to shift towards Kalthira, then turned and started towards the bridge. As he crossed the few dozen steps, one of the overhead lights flickered, and Elias reached up and flicked the bulb with his finger. It burned bright for a moment, then flickered and went out with a loud pop. Across his room, Rust lifted his head, and his ears swiveled towards Elias. He then barked once and put his head down. I know you're trying to sleep. I didn't break the light on purpose, Elias said. The dog's short tail hit the metal of the ship's wall twice wagging, even though the dog's eyes were already closed. He had chosen the Calite Hound because besides being bred to survive in almost any environment, the breed had gene modifications that made Rust significantly smarter. Elias had owned dogs most of his life and never really cared how smart they were, but Rust was as close to a partner as he had and sometimes that meant he needed to do things a normal dog wouldn't be able to do. According to the breeder, he was nearly as smart as a dolphin. Elias didn't know any dolphins, but Rust was smarter than most of the people he knew, and caused a lot fewer problems. Elias carefully placed the light bulb onto the workbench, and over the next 15 minutes removed the cover, replaced the diode, then put the cover back on. He only had a few dozen diodes left, and as minor as light bulbs might seem, he didn't want to be stuck halfway between nowhere and nothing without the ship's lights. He needed to visit someplace civilized enough to get at least basic supplies, he thought, as he carefully put the light bulb back into place. He then went to the bridge and sat down in the old worn chair. A piece of leather was coming off to reveal foam beneath. He ignored it for now as he checked the ship's sensors. Star charts were useless this far out. The best ones had records of planets' atmospheres. That told you about as much as the color of someone's shirt told you about them. But he liked it that way. Too many scouts explored the borders of the Commonwealth. You might make a living that way. There were bounties on survey systems near enough to the Commonwealth for one of the corporations to move in and strip mine it, and you could always get small work with colonies. But you'd never hit it big. And more importantly, you'd never have a real adventure. There was one planet that had caught his attention. Mostly, because when he was farther out, he'd assumed it was at least two, or perhaps three planets. Because every time he checked, its gravitational pull on its star was different. But now he suspected something far stranger than having a system with several planets in close orbit was happening. It was a single planet with a different gravitational pull every few hours. This time it registers having almost 8% more mass than before. That was impossible. Planets didn't just change size, and any known technology that could manipulate artificial gravity at a planetary scale would use so much energy he'd have seen the energy signal from light years out. That meant new technology, or something even stranger. Either way, he could make good money. He changed course, then glanced past Rust into the secondary cargo hold. It was half full. That wouldn't have been a problem if the main cargo hold on the deck below him hadn't been so close to empty, but he had missed a few meals before, and as long as the water recycler worked, he'd get to a colony before he missed too many meals. So, what harm could there be in exploring one more planet? It took almost two days to get to the planet. It had no name, and Elias resisted giving it one. Better to find out what the inhabitants called it rather than having to learn a new name. But he picked up plenty of other information. It was small for an inhabited planet, but its gravity showed that it fluctuated between about 30% less gravity than Earth to about 20% more, and it had nearly the same amount of dry land as Earth. But what was strangest was that the dry land had a far more circular pattern than you found on most worlds. From what he could see, every shore and many of the islands had long circular lines, as if the entire world had been shaped over thousands or perhaps millions of years. And Elias suspected that the center of each of those circles was what he was looking for, a source of artificial gravity on a scale large enough and existing long enough to have shaped this world. About half of those circles had centers at the bottom of the planet's oceans. So, he picked one that had its center in an enormous mountain range. 
one that would be all but impossible in another world. The ghost wake shuddered as it neared the planet. No matter how good artificial gravity was, it was never quite the same as the real thing. But he successfully landed on a small strip of forested land that was about halfway up a cliff, so the ship wasn't easy to see and was nearly impossible to get to. He then strapped his trusty old plasma pistol to his side. He had carried the Talon through the entire war with him, and it had saved him more than once when more complicated weapons had failed. On his other hip was his Zenic Blade, a long curved ceremonial dagger taken off the body of a Zenic priest during the war. It was an excellent weapon, with a blade that never seemed to dull even after using it to cut kindling, and it was half the weight of a human combat knife. But that wasn't why he had it. The dagger was a reminder of an oath he had taken, one of the few oaths that he had kept. He started exploring by stepping outside only long enough to make a circle around the ghost wake to make sure it was secure. After that, he took Rust a hundred yards to the edge of the cliff to look out over the world. Rust was as excited as ever to get out of the ship. The dog stayed near Elias, except to mark his territory in every tree they passed. The world was beautiful, and the sight reminded Elias of why he was a scout, as he sat and watched the world that no human had ever seen before. Across the way was a waterfall running down from snow at the top of another peak. It fell hundreds of feet, creating a wide and permanent rainbow. There were animals too. Every world was variations on the theme of evolution, but it always found similar melodies. There were predators and preys, birds, fish, insects, and all the others, though the more evolved things were, the more variation crept in. But none of that was why Elias was here. He knew that somewhere in that valley was the center of a circle of artificial gravity that covered half a continent. Even that wasn't what he was looking for now. What he spotted was a small wisp of smoke. None of this fully added up. Everything said that this world had to have a population at least as advanced as humans, but every sign was of a people that hadn't even discovered agriculture. But they had discovered fire. That suggested both intelligence and told him the valley wasn't empty. As he watched the smoke, he said, Sorry, Rust, but I think you're going to have to stay with the ship this time. The dog huffed once, then put its head back down. They sat there for another hour. It was too late to start exploring. Traveling on an inhabited world alone was dangerous enough. Doing it in the dark was just stupid. So, he spent the evening gathering samples from most of the common plants, and a few of the uncommon plants that looked interesting. With some luck, he might help restock the ship. He then put the ship into ground mode. It would feed and water rust, as well as gathering power and air. Then, once the sun was all the way down, he moved slowly and carefully back out to the cliff's edge. Spotting the smoke during the day from a small fire wasn't that easy. Spotting fire at night was far easier, especially in a world without a moon. That was lucky for them, he thought. The planet's orbit already had to be erratic because of the artificial gravity. A moon would have made that much worse, assuming it didn't just crash into them. Elias had expected a few small campfires. This area was too big and had too many resources for it to be entirely empty, but there were hundreds. A population density that was another sign of something odd about this planet. After a good night's sleep in the ghost wake, Elias double-checked the plant's arboretum and made sure Rust had his favorite toy. He then grabbed his pack and his walking stick and made his way out again. His knee hurt more today. That wasn't surprising. He always limp more on planet side. But a minor limp wasn't too bad since he'd been shot in that knee during the war. He tried not to think about the war. Instead, he focused on getting down. That wouldn't be the hard part. He simply rappelled down the side of the cliff. Even getting up shouldn't be that hard, since gravity was so much lower than it should be, enough that even the air rose higher, letting him breathe in areas where the air should have been so thin he was exhausted in minutes. The sun was barely over the horizon as he reached the ground. It was a day's hike to the center of the gravity field, and you didn't rush in a planet you didn't know, so he'd go halfway, set up a secure camp early, and make it to the center at midday tomorrow. The gravity here had shaped the world as environments shape all worlds, but it was more complex than on most worlds. The trees were tall and thin, having evolved in this area and adapted to lower gravity. But the birds showed no signs of adapted to low gravity, likely because they moved between the different gravities too much. He then entered a small clearing on the path and came face to face with four people. They looked a little bit like an insectoid centaur, with a long body that had six legs that changed into a more upfront body with four arms. They had large packs across their backs, and one had half a dozen small children holding onto their backs. They stopped quickly, and the largest pointed a spear at Elias. That was a natural reaction, and in most situations, the correct one. Not wanting a fight, Elias held up his hands, fingers splayed out and crept back. 
there was always a chance that could trigger an aggressive response. But most intelligent species avoided conflict if they could, and the population density suggested they weren't overly territorial. The one with the spear didn't lower it right away, but he didn't move forward either. And once Elias was a few steps back, one of them began to make a series of clicking noises that was likely a language. Elias didn't know if that was directed at him, but he didn't have years to learn their language, so they'd have to get by with gestures and hope. But he still responded as he said, You won't understand me, but I just want to look around. There was silence for a moment, and then it lowered its spear. After it did, a native with blue and red streaks through the green carapace moved forward. The one with the children on his back chirped something as he approached, but he shook one of his hands at her. He then raised two of his hands up and spread his fingers out. Elias couldn't help but smile. This was a teenager ignoring his mother. He didn't need a language to recognize that. But curiosity was a trait that Elias appreciated. So Elias began to move his fingers slowly, carefully not to do anything else that might surprise them. The alien teen mimicked him. With the agreement to attempt to communicate clear, Elias reached slowly into his belt and carefully removed the small metal stick he carried in it. The alien started to mimic him, but didn't have anything to reach for, so he simply watched him. The alien took a step back when Elias drew his curved dagger from his belt, but Elias was careful to move slowly and stayed far enough back he was no danger. But even as he drew the dagger, the entire group seemed to have relaxed. Elias bent down near the ground, and, with a firm, sharp swipe, he ran the dagger along the ferrocerium rod next to a small bunch of grass. The sparks would have impressed them, but the fire was clearly more interesting, and the young alien stepped forward, looking at the fire and clicking. Elias showed him the rod once more, then pointed at the flint hand axe in his belt. He then mimicked his movement with a knife again. After a second, the kid carefully put his hand out. Elias had shown people how to do this a few times, so he held out the rod, but then took the chance to move closer when the kid pointed the rod in the wrong way. He carefully pulled the tip of the rod out so it didn't point at the teen. That way he wouldn't burn himself. It took three tries, but when the sparks came, the young man dropped the rod and stepped back. He then quickly stepped up and snatched the rod off the ground. He held it carefully for a moment and then looked up slowly and, clearly reluctantly, held it out towards Elias. He clearly wanted it, but he wasn't sure if it was a gift. Elias wished he could explain that it wouldn't work forever, Instead, he took a second rod from his pouch, put it in the boy's hand, and then slowly pushed his fingers around the rods. There was more clicking, and the two rods disappeared into his pouch, but a few fish hooks made from rocks came out to replace it. They had been made carefully and were certainly something the young man cared about. When you traveled constantly, you didn't carry things you didn't need, but unlike the rods, it was something he could get more, and Elias always collected useful tools from the world he visited. All too often, humans overcomplicated things. These were people who knew how to survive in this world, and their tools would be most useful. Once the fish hooks were safely in one of Elias' packs, he pointed towards the center of the area where he was going. The people seemed easy enough to deal with, but he'd rather not have to go through the same introduction a dozen more times. There was some clicking and pointing, and after a few minutes they seemed to understand, and the small group turned and started that way. Elias followed them. Author's Note as you've likely noticed, the story hasn't reached its conclusion. That's because this is a series, and for its pilot episode, I wanted extra time to get to know Elias. I've already finished the second half, and it gets deeper into the lore of this world, while continuing to expand the character of Elias as well. So, if you want to know how this story ends, then subscribe to this channel. Or if you're just watching this later, check the corner to find the link. And if you just can't wait to read more of my stuff, there are several Space Scout stories that free members of my patron at patreon.com slash elton can read. They have different protagonists, but they touch on some of the themes and tones I hope to capture with this series. And what is that tone? It's something between the hyper-advanced world of Star Trek and the just-trying-to-survive nature of Firefly, a place where the future and the past can collide and anything can happen. Thank you, Elton Gar.